In general, molecules characterized by electron delocalization can have multiple resonance forms. And a question that arises as we start to draw and think about these resonance forms is which is the, the best? Which is the most faithful or the closest to reality representation of the structure of the molecule? And that's the subject of the start of this video. We're going to develop some criteria for assessing the relative contributions of various resonance forms. For example, we'll be able to notice that probably from the three resonance structures shown here among these three, this structure is the best for reasons that will become clear very shortly. And we often want to draw and think about that best resonance form just because it's it's closest to the true situation, right? It, it's closest to the actual quantum chemical structure. It's closest to the thing that's actually in our reaction flask. All right, so let's talk about these criteria, criteria or rules for judging the relative importance or significance or contributions of resonance forms to a resonance hybrid. And these are listed roughly in order of importance with the most important rule first. The number one rule is the most significant resonance forms have the greatest number of filled octets or are satisfying the octet rule best, if you like. So the example shown here, we've got a first resonance form with a positively charged carbon, and we have an adjacent oxygen with a lone pair. So we have this C plus next to a lone pair um, structural pattern, and we can generate a resonance form with a CO pi bond and positive charge on oxygen. Based on a rule about the greatest number of filled octets here, the major contributor has an octet on every atom, and the minor contributor has the carbon with a deficiency of electrons, fewer than eight total electrons, right? And so the major contributor here is going to be this one. And this tells us, for instance, and this is a point we'll return to shortly, that there's some double bond character between carbon and oxygen, quite a bit, in fact, because this is the major contributor. Rule number two is that the structure with fewer formal charges is generally more significant or a greater contributor than the structure with more formal charges. So for example here, we've got a neutral molecule that it fits into this pattern of an allylic lone pair. Lone pair here adjacent to a carbon-nitrogen double bond. And so we can flow electrons like this. And in the resulting resonance form, we've got a positively charged nitrogen and a negatively charged nitrogen. So we go from a structure with no formal charges to one with two formal charges. And here we can push the Cn pi electrons, which we've generated a new Cn double bond, up to that uh, nitrogen, like so. Here we've got that polarized pi bond pattern uh, that tells us resonance is significant, significant here. And that leads to this structure. Now, the issue with, with this structure is uh, we have no octet at the carbocation, right? So that's why this is the least significant or the most minor, if you like, contributor. This one is a major contributor, but it's not the best resonance form because we have charge separation. We have formal charges, positive and negative, whereas in the main contributor, we have no formal charges at all. So other things being equal, particularly with respect to rule number one, the structure with fewer formal charges is most significant. And notice that lacking an octet makes this resonance form uh, the least important or least significant of the three. Rule number three says that other things being equal, a structure with negative charge on the more electronegative element is more significant than one with negative charge on a less electronegative element. And we can actually develop a similar rule for positive charge. Putting positive charge on the less electronegative element leads to a more significant structure than one with positive charge on the more electronegative element. There we go, said that right the first time. So here, for example, we have two resonance forms. One has negative charge on an oxygen atom. One has negative charge on a carbon atom. And notice this is an example of an allylic lone pair. Lone pair connected via a single bond to a carbon-carbon double bond. So the major contributor here is the one with the negative charge on the more electronegative oxygen atom, where it's happier, quote unquote. And the minor contributor has negative charge on the less electronegative carbon atom, where it's not as happy, right? Because carbon is less electronegative than oxygen. On the right here, we have an example of a cation in the situation with a cation. In the first resonance form, we have a positively charged oxygen, and we have a neutral nitrogen. And notice again, we've got an allylic lone pair situation with an al a lone pair adjacent to a carbon-oxygen double bond. And so we can flow electrons, and when we do, the alternative resonance form has positive charge on nitrogen, 
and the oxygen is now neutral. So if we think about electronegativity in relation to positive charge, positive charge prefers to be on the less electronegative element. So here, the positive charge is less happy on the oxygen. That makes this structure a minor contributor with positive formal charge on the oxygen atom. And positive charge is happier on the less electronegative nitrogen atom, which is what makes this a, resonance con a major resonance contributor to this structure. All right, rule number four. Resonance forms that are perfectly superimposable are what we call equivalent. They're equally good, right? We can basically perfectly overlay them, right? Even though they may show, for example, charges at different specific atoms, we can rotate one around to perfectly superimpose them. In that case, the resonance forms are equivalent and they contribute equally to the resonance hybrid. Carbonate, which is shown here in its three different resonance forms, three different significant resonance forms, is a classic example of this. And it's got the allylic lone pair structure built into it, right? So we can push electrons around. This shifts the negative charge around, but all three of those are equivalent resonance forms. The geometric information isn't there, right? But that central carbon is trigonal planar. And so these three structures are perfectly superimposable. So they're all equal contributors to the resonance hybrid, something like 33.3%. Now this figure also includes a resonance form where we, we take the CO double bond electrons and push those up to oxygen, like so. That generates this structure, but this is not a significant resonance contributor to the structure of carbonate because of the lack of an octet at uh, that central carbon atom and the charge separation that we introduced in pushing that pi uh, bond up to oxygen. So the point of rule number four is if you've run through rules one through three and don't see a difference and notice that the resonance forms are perfectly superimposable, they're all equivalent or equal contributors. And we've seen uh, an example of equal contributors previously in the allyl cation, where these structures were perfectly superimposable if we go all the way back to allyl cation here. These two resonance forms, if I just took this one and flipped it over like this, right, I would generate this structure exactly. So they're perfectly superimposable. They are equivalent resonance forms, and so allyl cation is on some level 50% this and 50% this structure. We've done a deep dive into resonance structures. Let's return to this idea of the resonance hybrid as a weighted average of the various resonance forms. Now that we have a good sense of how to weight the resonance forms using these four rules that we've seen previously, we can get an idea of how to sort of qualitatively compute the sort of weighted average of the various properties. And the properties we're interested here in here are bond orders and bond lengths, the partial atomic charges, where are the positive and negative charges and how are they spread out over the atoms in the molecule, and chemical reactivity. And we'll touch on how we think about chemical reactivity in a resonance context at the end of this video, but this will also come up again and again and again as you dig into reactions throughout your study of organic chemistry. So the resonance hybrid is a weighted average of all the resonance forms rate weighted by their relative contributions. We know this. For example, allyl cation, two equivalent resonance forms. In one resonance form, if we focus on, for example, one of the two carbon-carbon bonds, in one resonance form, the bond order is two. In the other resonance form, the bond order is one. But allyl cation is 50% this and 50% this. That means that the bond order in the true structure is 1.5, half of one plus half of two, right? What about the charges? Well, the resonance forms tell us that the, the charge is 50% on this carbon and 50% on this carbon. And since the total charge is plus one, that means we've got a charge of plus 0.5 on this end and a charge of plus 0.5 on this end. Notice also that the central carbon in both structures is neutral, meaning that at least according to this sort of a, a bit superficial resonance model, the central carbon is neutral. The central carbon does not share the positive charge. The positive charge is only shared by the two end carbons. From a reactivity point of view, this tells us that the two terminal or the two end carbons in allyl cation are the Lewis acidic carbons. These are the ones that are sharing the bulk of the positive charge. And in fact, I can't resist going back one more time to this first slide we looked at with allyl cation. If you look at the quantum mechanical structure, you will see that there's at least in this structure, less negative charge, right? There's more positive charge at these terminal carbons and the central carbon is more negative. And so the central carbon in allyl cation is not 
Lewis acidic. And thinking carefully about the resonance structures helps us see that pretty easily, just by recognizing that in no resonance structures is the central carbon of allyl cation positively charged. So both terminal carbons are Lewis acidic, electrophilic, but the internal carbon is not. And resonance structures give you a lot of insight into these sites of reactivity in molecules with electron delocalization. Places where negative and positive charges show up in resonance structures are key points of reactivity. And where they don't show up are not key points of reactivity, I guess, is the other side of the coin there. To finish off our discussion of resonance, we're going to focus on what is actually going on with delocalized electrons from an orbital point of view or electron density point of view. How does electron delocalization actually come about? The essence of electron delocalization in organic molecules is pi bonding over more than two atoms. Pi bonding over three or more atoms leads to electron delocalization. And so as we push, one thing you'll notice as you push electrons around and generate resonance forms is you're making and breaking pi bonds, showing pi bonding interactions between more than just two atoms in a delocalized structure. And pi bonds in resonance forms are derived from the overlap of adjacent p orbitals, right? You saw this back in introductory chemistry with valence bond theory. Pi bonds are made from p orbitals overlapping in a side-on fashion. And the same is true in delocalized organic molecules. The upshot of this is any pair of electrons that we engage in resonance is located in or is occupying a p orbital. And this has very important consequences for geometry and hybridization that we'll explore on this slide and the next. We have to consider resonance when determining hybridization and geometry now. And what we do is, for any resonance active pair of electrons, or at resonance active atoms more generally, we subtract one p orbital from the quote unquote naive hybridization, the hybridization that you'd pick, predict based on Vesper theory and introductory chemistry, at these atoms that have resonance active electron pairs. So let's look at an example of this, focusing on the nitrogen in this amide functional group. This is a resonance active atom it's got the allylic lone pair structure built into it so we can flow electrons like this and generate this alternative resonance form that's right here. Now, what would you predict for the hybridization of this nitrogen based on this resonance form alone? You know what, let's zoom in. Forget that the other resonance form exists for a second. What would you predict for the hybridization of that nitrogen? Well, naively, it's got four electron pair domains and so we need four hybrid orbitals to account for those four electron pair domains. Naively, we would predict sp3 hybridization at that nitrogen. However, if we look at the other resonance form, we'll notice something that's a little bit off. This nitrogen does not look sp3 in this resonance form, where there's a carbon-nitrogen pi bond right here. All of a sudden now, it looks sp2 in this other resonance form. And the, the key thing is, in drawing these curved arrows and drawing the alternative resonance form, we are saying that nitrogen is engaged in pi bonding. That pair of electrons that appears non-bonding is actually not non-bonding at all. It's a bonding pair of electrons. And as a bonding pair of electrons, it's bonding via occupying a p orbital and engaging in pi bonding with the adjacent carbon, as this alternative resonance form shows. So that pair of electrons being engaged in pi bonding is occupying a p orbital. That occupied p orbital is sort of subtracted from the true hybridization. So the hybridization of that nitrogen atom is actually sp2, not sp3. And then the resonance hybrid, which shows a partial pi bond between carbon and nitrogen, we kind of draw the same conclusion. This nitrogen really only has three electron pair domains, three sigma bonds and one pi bond. And so the hybridization is really sp2. And as a rule, if you want a rule for assigning hybridization when resonance is involved, for every resonance active atom that you're looking at, subtract one p orbital from the naive hybridization when you have a, a lone pair on an atom that's actually engaged in pi bonding as suggested by the resonance forms. Before we leave this slide, I'll just remark briefly on the, the oxygen atom. The oxygen atom, you know, if you look over here, it looks naively sp3. But if you look at the initial resonance form, we understand that oxygen is engaged in pi bonding. This so-called lone pair is really not a lone pair at all. It's not non-bonding. It's a bonding pair. There is a CO pi bond. And so the hybridization of that oxygen is sp2 for sure.